to nine months. Mr. Chandrasekhar has a long and important to-do list when it comes to AI. He's trying to engage with social media platforms to tackle the menace of deep fakes, help him, Indian startups and innovators to ride the AI wave, help set up large compute facilities locally to train AI models, and draw up new regulations to create a filter to separate the good AI from bad. A huge round of applause for the minister. And joining him on stage to drive this session, Shireen Bhan, the managing editor of CNBC TV 18. Thank you very much, Chandra. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, what an absolute pleasure it is to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to say Bangalore uh, is uh, a city with the maximum amount of energy. So uh, big kudos to the Bangalore crowd for being here through the morning. And I have to say the quality of conversations has been absolutely impeccable. Uh, I've been soaking in, learning a lot more than I knew when I walked in through this door uh, about AI and about what the future of AI looks like. Mr. Chandrasekhar, without further ado, let's, let's get started. Uh, you know, through the conversations this morning, everybody was, of course, talking about the opportunities, but also talking about some of the crucial challenges that we need to contend with, including some of the key deficits, whether it's capital or it is compute. Let me start by asking you about compute, because the Prime Minister at the successful AI uh, summit recently that concluded spoke about the AI mission that the government intends to launch. If you can lay the roadmap out for us on what we intend to do, how we intend to bridge the compute deficit. So thank you, Shireen. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, I'm glad I made it. It was touch and go, but I made it for this uh, program. Look, our approach towards AI, I need to first lay out what our government's approach is and what our Prime Minister's vision and expectation of AI is, and then I can tell you some of the other moving parts. Uh, we see AI as a, a very significant bolt-on to this already galloping digital economy. So it is a uh, in some ways, we, we, we communicate this as a kinetic enabler of our digital economy. So we see a significant amount of growth that we will see uh, come out of AI and the ecosystem that will develop. And while there is a lot of conversation about safety, trust, and the harms of AI, we are very focused on that. For enabling that, we have uh, put together an overall framework that talks about AI compute capacity, the need to, uh, for the government to deploy resources, financial resources, uh, in creating more foundational models and LLMs and real-life use cases. Uh, so there will be, like in the semiconductor model, we will fund startups. Mm. Uh, we have certainly a very uh, clear focus on building an academic industry startup research ecosystem which we refer to as the Innovation and Research Center. So we, will, we think we will have about uh, 10, 12 of them around the country that will be part funded by the government. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, many other adjacent areas, including AI chips, that we are going to have as an intersection between the Semicon program and the India AI mission. Uh, so AI compute clearly, uh, since you asked me that, let me say that we will have two components to it. One is a pure private sector led, a very similar to the design in the semiconductor space where we will uh, incentivize that mm -hmm. investment. And then we will have a significant indigis, indigenously developed public sector capacity of AI compute coming out of CDAC. So you will have both these. Uh, these, are, these are going to be available to the Indian ecosystem of both uh, the larger enterprises and the startup ecosystem that are certainly, that, that our intention is to get them to catalyze and grow the ecosystem. This is broadly, mm -hmm. as I say back in Delhi, Mota Mota. <laughs> this is the framework that we have. Uh, early in January, hopefully before the second week, we will have what will be, again, I use the semiconductor uh, example, we'll have the first India AI, like a global India AI summit where every participant, practitioner, stakeholder in the Indian AI ecosystem, including but not limited to the academic uh, network, will be uh, participating. There will be global you know, practitioners of AI. And the idea is really to sort of, in a sense, launch it hmm. there. And launch it with all of these enabling elements in place so that nobody then looks back and says, I don't have this or I don't have this. It's just a question of then, you know, 
meeting some real milestones in the short term and the near term. Well, thank you very much for laying out motor motor what the roadmap looks like. I am going to try and uh, get some more granularity sure. from you, but I, you know, I have to say this: I'm distracted by the two pens and a pencil in your pocket. We're talking about AI, Mr. Chandrasekhar. You're actually walking around with a pencil. Why is that? Uh, 35 years of tech and uh, living and breathing in the hybrid world of uh, the future and the past. So I, I've always had a pencil in my pocket. I don't know why, but a, a natural pencil, pencil is, yeah, is always what you walk around with. Yeah. But let me let me try and uh, pick up on what you said. Uh, like what we saw with the semiconductor program where the government has actually put an incentive scheme in place which will run over the next few years. Is that going to be part of the plan? You gave us a broad hint that that is what the government is considering at this point in time. If you can lay out for us what the thinking is and what the quantum of government funding is likely to be. Shane, uh, we know what it will take to make India AI successful. We also have an ambition that India AI should play if not a, the leading role, one of the leading programs that will shape the future of AI. So our ambitions are very clear. Now, to build those ambitions and to realize those ambitions, we understand very clearly that we need to catalyze and create a seriously global standard ecosystem of startups and innovators. And what do they in turn want? They need resources, they need financial resources, they need AI compute resources, they need partnerships with our academic institutions. So we have laid down clearly what in a sense is the formula for our innovation ecosystem to succeed and be extremely strong and visible player in the shaping of AI as we are going to see it in the next two to five years. Uh, all of those elements we will put together. So it will be very similar to semiconductor where there is a lot of public resources, financial mm. and infrastructure that will be made available to startups, large corporates, etc., etc. And Clearly, for large infrastructure builds like AI compute, there will be an element of public sector incentives or subsidies, as you saw in the semiconductor space. 70,000 crores was the ballpark number as no, far as semiconductor think, I don't think you need that. No, that? I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I, can, I don't want to get into, uh, be baited into the number, but I can certainly tell you that you don't need that kind of number. You certainly today, uh, we are already at an inflection point, the AI ecosystem in India. To get it really going and fly to the Mars and the Saturn and the moon of AI, we certainly no, don't need those resources. Uh, I can tell you, I can report from GPE in Delhi that what we are seeing uh, uh, in terms of real action, real solutions, real um, IP that is coming out of the Indian ecosystem without all of this, it tells me clearly that you don't need anything uh, even remotely close to the semiconductor. Semiconductor, the investments are huge, the capital investments are huge as you know, and, um, and you, you know, a fab costs you seven, eight billion dollars, mm. so it's, it's not in the same ballpark. But, like I said, the formula we, we have designed, we know clearly what is required to really make this a really competitive global standard ecosystem. Uh, we need, we want winners, we, we, we believe there will be winners out of the India AI ecosystem in the next one or two years and we certainly know what it will take to make these winners succeed. You know, since we're talking about the ingredients of what it will take for us to actually uh, see winners emerge out of the Indian AI ecosystem, let's talk about one of the challenges that people are, are putting on the table today, and that is procurement as far as GPUs are concerned. Uh, the CEO of NVIDIA uh, in September was talking about supercomputers and how India will be one of the beneficiaries of the faster supercomputer that NVIDIA finally puts out into the market. But at this point in time, OpenAI, for instance, in his words, is about 10,000 GPUs. Uh, given the, the plans that the Indian government has rolled out as part of OpenAI, etc., do you believe that that's going to be a challenge? Uh, you know, we have Chris Miller here who will talk about the chip wars in a second. Yeah. Just before this, we had a panel talking about the possibility of a glut versus a shortage. Uh, where does the government uh, come in on this, weigh in on this for no, us? I, I, I will very confidently tell you with more than a deep, more than a little understanding of the situation, that that problem of a shortage is the problem that is going to go away the fastest. Uh, what we think is the big problem today of AI compute is not really the challenge that we have. I think that is a challenge. Uh, there are many other uh, players that are trying to catch up with NVIDIA. Nobody likes a trillion dollar market cap and say, I don't have it. So there are the AMDs of the world and there are uh, Intels of the world who are playing catch up. They're six, eight months behind. 
So I don't think, I think if you list out all of the challenges that we have to deal with as government or the ecosystem or startups, that challenge will be the challenge that will vanish the fastest. So what would you put, put down as the number one challenge that you're most I concerned think there about? Are, I mean, there are certainly much more fundamental challenges like talent. Hmm. There, this, is a, uh, this is an industry, this is an ecosystem that is going to real, need really top-notch uh, capability. We need PhDs, we need postdoctoral, we need master's uh, programs in our academic institution to churn out those real cutting-edge talent. This is not coding. This is, not, this is no longer a uh, uh, walk in the park in terms of uh, the, the abilities that are called uh, to be brought to bear uh, in, to, to, in, this, in this area. So talent, I think, is for me, if uh, something keeps me awake uh, at nights when I talk about semiconductor or AI, it is certainly the big uh, the challenge of creating a world standard talent. The infra pieces, I can assure you today to all of you here, uh, and you can hold me uh, responsible for the statement, that I think all of these other infra enabler pieces will get solved very quickly. Um, and whether it's an NVIDIA GPU that is going to power it, or whether it's a mix of NVIDIA, AMD, x86, whatever, don't worry about that. Hmm. I think what we really need to focus is how do we get our academic institutions to really start focusing on the kind of talent that this ecosystem will just sop up in the coming years. And do we have it now mm. or don't we have it? If we have it, how good are they? Can we make them better? Uh, so I think those are the areas that I am focused on, creating these innovation and research centers that are housed as partnerships between startups and academic institutions. It's not something that we have done, done very well. And IIT, uh, Dr. Yeah. Junjunwal is here. That is an exception a very uh, visible exception to the general rule mm. that academic institutions love pushing out degrees. I was in a uh, program recently with a lot of vice chancellors and I said 15 years ago the way you measured an institution was how many of them went and got hired by Google you know, or how many, of the, how many students went abroad. I know in my generation the way you measured an institution as being great is 80% ah, of your batch went abroad. Today, it's a different metric that uh, academic institutions have to pivot to, which is how many of my students are really going out there and building world-class platforms and systems. So, so all of these are uh, real challenges. The obsession with AI computer, I understand. Part of it is fanned by NVIDIA, I think. Uh, they, they love being uh, in a shortage economy. And so that's fine. That's fair. But I think that will be the easiest problem to solve and it will be the problem that will vanish the fastest. Okay, the easiest problem to solve and of course our capability building uh, uh, within organizations and academia you believe is going to be the top priority in the focus area. Let's now address the issue of regulation because that again uh, perhaps is getting a disproportionate amount of mind space and headline space as well. Let's address that issue in the context of the New Delhi Declaration. You said uh, in a quick conversation with my colleague Ashmit a few days ago that we don't intend to talk in abstracts and over the next six months you intend to actually put down very clearly what the roadmap is going to look like. Now as we forge consensus between 29 countries on what the road ahead for AI regulation should look like, what is India's own position going to be? The US is taking a position, we've got the Biden administration issuing an executive order, uh, you've got the UK doing its thing with the Bletchley Declaration, you've got the EU moving. What is India's own position going to be on regulation? So to understand this, Shireen, uh, first of all, we need to understand that in the last 12 to 18 months, the world that talked about AI in very abstract, generic, you know, fuzzy, warm terms 18 months ago has suddenly been catapulted into this totally real AI world where every discourse is not now in the abstract. Now, when you talk about safety and trust of AI, it is no longer about ethics or responsibility or responsible use or some warm and fuzzy concept like that. It is now post chat GPT. Uh, you can see today, I was at the Bletchley Park uh, Safety Summit that was organized by the government of UK, that countries have moved from the abstract of AI to the the real granular uh, focus on safety of AI. And I said in, at Bletchley that I think we are making a mistake by 
correcting it so much mm. that you are now creating a narrative that is demonizing AI. Mm. And I said very clearly, and this is the stand of the government, and you heard the Prime Minister say at GPA inaugural as well, we consider AI as fundamentally an empowering technology. It is the greatest invention of our times. It is the greatest empowering technology of the times. We believe that it can be used to do things in healthcare, disease, uh, uh, agriculture, governance, in ways that we would have taken years and decades to do. However, what the world did not notice in 10 years of social media about the safety and harm mm. and user harms and criminality, we should certainly wake up to it now and create not an American framework or a European framework or an Indian framework, a global framework. Mm. The nature of the internet and, the, and our experiences with social media and the toxicity and the crime and the harms on it have shown us that notwithstanding any country having great rules and laws and regulations, Singapore has great laws, uh, Australia has great uh, laws, uh, China has no laws but they have a great <laughs> safe internet. Uh, so none of that works because of the ubiquitous nature of the You're in a provocative mood, aren't you? <laughs> with, with, with China, there's no need to be provoked. It's just stating the fact is enough. Uh, uh, no, so the ubiquitous nature of the internet and therefore the fact that almost 80-90% of cyber crimes, cyber harms are extra jurisdictional. That means mm. the perpetrator is in one jurisdiction, the victim is in a second yeah. and the crime is in a third. So there is, n there is no way to avoid creating a global understanding on certain principles. So what GPA has done this year uh, in New, New Delhi is to say, look, AI should be inclusive. It should certainly not be the, like the old model where a few countries have it and everybody else is a, a wannabe and uh, you know, want to have. So it should be inclusive. Second is that we need a global framework and we need the global framework to be done very quickly mm. because in the next six, eight, ten months, AI is going to come at us as, uh, as uh, Mustafa Suleiman says in his book, The Coming Wave, in a way and form and shape that we uh, are not even ready to anticipate mm. or understand. Mm. So we need these things in place very quickly and we need this as a granular set of principles and rules that all countries can follow, not in the abstract. If all of us keep saying AI should be responsible and AI should be ethical, that's certainly not enough because I can assure you that one person's ethical interpretation of ethics, of interpretation of ethics is very different from the other. And mm. then we'll have an ombudsman sitting there and adjudicating your ethics versus mine. Sure. So I think we need rules, we need some guidelines, we need principles. India has made some steps since 2021 on talking about openness, mm. safety and trust and accountability, legal accountability of platforms. Our approach today towards AI, and this is for those practitioners in the room today, is through the prism of casting legal accountability on platforms for the safety and trust of that platform. Mm. So uh, that is broadly our approach to it at this moment. And like I said, it, it will evolve. We think between uh, Delhi's India AI launched and Slovenia, we have a, uh, a conference in February and then we will have something in June, July. In the next six months, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, we should have a broad understanding among countries of the world, if not all, but most, about what ought to be the guardrails, what ought to be the legal guardrails and accountability framework for AI platforms. No, and I, I agree with you. I think the same debate has happened as far as cryptocurrencies are concerned as well because it is interjurisdictional, yeah. and so it doesn't make sense to have country-specific yeah. guardrails being put in place. The difference, the, yeah. uh, Shirin, if I may just add, uh, interrupt, is that in crypto and in social media, the innovation ran so far ahead of regulation that everything, everybody was playing catch up. Mm. The opportunity we have in AI now is AI is at an inflection point. If we now agree on what ought to be the rules and guardrails that allow innovation as well as protect citizens and users from the harms, then we'll be at the right time. If you wait for another year, 
then this thing would have gone ahead again and we would be playing catch up governments would be playing catch up and people would be playing catch up you know there are, there are two points that i want to pick up on one of course is this catch up between innovation and regulation i'll come to that in just a second but i want to address the risks issue because when the prime minister spoke he of course spoke about the fact that ai is the 21st century's greatest development tool or yes. has the potential to be the 21st century's great development tool but at the same time he also said it poses the most significant danger to the 21st century as well now as a government what are you most concerned about because again disproportionate headlines going into deep fakes and how the government is most concerned about deep fake seven day deadline given to fix accountability and clean this up and so on and so forth but outside of that what are the risks that you are most concerned about well, there are many risks and i i, I one of the things shireen is to start now and trying to predict all the risk and the whole uh, you know the sort of a lay of the land of risks and harms of ai is uh, i don't think anybody in the room even if you have a double phd post doctoral will you know even uh, try and uh, hazard a guess like that i think we have we have, what our approach is make sure there are some principles mm. make sure there's a list of harms and criminality as we see it today and then keep adding to it as we encounter it malicious models bias built into models and algorithms there are so many things that can come at us uh, at different ways from an ai model how a deep fake certainly is a classic example because misinformation and patently false information is a disease that social media has spread and is causing especially in democratic countries harm to the power of you know like almost intolerable it creates divisions it creates incitement it creates uh, fake narratives so misinformation has been a problem with social media now imagine misinformation raised to the power of infinity mm. powered by ai and shireen bhan is on tv today saying something uh, abusive about rajiv chandrasekhar and that goes viral uh, or i am saying something about uh, money control and that goes viral i'm 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 not no, no, I, 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 you get the I, point i know people people who know me yeah. know that i would never say anything abusive yeah, yeah. about anybody yeah, exactly <laughs> and so so people will get a bit agitated if they see you doing it <laughs> so that's the point i'm saying that in in a society like ours we have 850 million indians yeah. on the internet we are going to be 1.2 billion indians uh, by 25 26 there are different types of people old young women or uh, men rural urban highly literate not so literate and then if you have this phenomenon of deep fakes which i have seen today that are going viral at 100x 150x in terms of the velocity and acceleration of these things vis-a-vis -vis the truth mm. in a, in a society like ours it is it really is a problem so pm uh, the honorable pm raised that as an issue because in a in a country like ours where democracy is sacrosanct the electoral process should be as uh, uh, unimpacted by these uh, these kind of things deep fakes have an ai therefore has a very very significant power to alter Uh, distort disrupt create uh, problems and it is an issue that we are very very serious about and i think the days when there is there was a little you know please do it if you can it'll be you'll be a good platform if you can uh, you know i'll buy you an extra coffee if you do a good job that is all gone now because we are now linking almost every one of the safeguards and guardrails to the criminal law hmm and so the 11 uh, no go areas for platforms which includes misinformation and patently false information which is deep fakes are essentially now becoming uh, judiciable under criminal law uh, so that is what we are saying we didn't say 7 days stop it or else we said 7 days read the rules uh, in detail mm. take 7 days to read it and on the eighth day realize what the rules say in terms of the consequences of violating the rules well speaking of consequences and and this links back to the question of regulation that we were having and we had the cosera uh, founder speaking to us in the morning where he believes that uh, the challenge perhaps in terms of this catch up of innovation and regulation that you spoke of is that regulation must not end up stifling innovation Absolutely at this point right. in time so a light touch approach is perhaps needed warranted at this point in time how do you view that no, Shireen, I, let's let's be clear i think we must move away from light touch hard touch i don't even know what that means honestly what does light touch mean is it self regulation mm. certainly not 
when we say accountability accountability means platforms have to be accountable under law sure to deliver on safety and trust expectations from the platform now light touch as in will people go barging into the platform's office uh, with heavy weaponry obviously not uh, so i think we need to move away from that old which is why we are in some of the problems that we are in which mm. is to assume that because it is tech and innovation there are no guardrails required mm. it is to assume, to assume that platforms have a highly developed sense of moral responsibility to the consumers that they serve that there is no need for the government to intervene which is what we did for the last 20 years mm. Uh, the us did it india did it all of the countries did it which is that innovation should not be regulated because innovation and regulation seem like contradictory terms however we are living in an age and era today where innovation with all the techno optimism that we believe mm. in certainly does a lot of good but innovation and these platforms also can be used by bad actors mm. now how do you dissuade the bad actors from using it a how do you dissuade platforms from creating the ability for bad actors to use it b that it has to be under law and i certainly don't want to characterize this as either soft touch or hard touch i think it is about making sure there is a very predictable clear transparent set of expectations legal expectations from platforms that serve consumers of india consumers of wherever and uh, and 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 recognize the fact that they have and the honorable prime minister said at gpa that platforms must also have a better sense of moral obligation to the platform they are developing everything the government cannot do we can't legislate mm. to the last mm. uh, i on uh, last dot on the i or the uh, cross the t so it there is needs to be an understanding that this harm and these kind of harms are So part the, of the landscape the era of self regulation over no no I, i think that 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 train left the station many many months and years ago uh, certainly there's going to be no self regulation uh, certainly uh, as a elected government or any elected government when you have an obligation to protect uh, 1.2 billion citizens from harm and criminality uh, we can't just say we'll leave it and outsource it to somebody and they'll do the uh, harm so that that i think we should not even uh, uh, we should not even think about that Uh, certainly there is an argument a case that to be made by the ai e ecosystem that you don't want to be prescriptive in your regulation mm. uh, there are some ge geographies in some countries that are getting very prescriptive that you need to you need to have this model tested like this you need to have this and that yeah. that is not what we are saying mm. we are saying basically the outcomes of bad actors outcomes of bad models should be uh, accountable uh, under law fair enough uh, you know one of the co comments uh, that i picked up on this morning through the course of the conversations was uh, that the future of ai as we look at india becoming a ai nation should be a jugalbandi a jugalbandi of public infrastructure uh, and private sector innovation or led by private sector innovation uh, what role uh, as conductor Uh, if i could use a music analogy do you see the government playing in this jugalbandi look i i can tell you something i've spent over three and a half decades in tech and uh, as being i mean and i consider myself very fortunate to be where i am today because what i see today and to be able to be an enabler coach mentor sort of cheerleader whatever you want to call it uh, is an absolute privilege because i think today the government's role is really to enable success to do whatever is required to be done to get if there are 100 startups here all of them should be able to say i have pursued my dream and i have either succeeded or failed mm. on my own account not because the government put up a roadblock or a government put up a hurdle or somebody didn't sign a file so it is clear in our, or uh, it's the the mission that we have been given by our prime minister is very clear there is a huge opportunity of a trillion dollar digital economy we are half way there we want to get there by 26 ai semiconductors electronics these are all big pieces of that we as the government will sit and do 24/7 7 days a week 365 days a year to make those ambitions come true not as implemented by the government but implemented by hundreds and thousands of startups and companies and innovators all around the country 
And I think you've seen that in the DPI, you've seen that in fintech, where a government use case has created one of the world's largest fintech mm. ecosystem. We are seeing that in semiconductors today, and I'll be, uh, I was excited to meet uh, Chris today, uh, that the, the numbers of people who are jumping in and designing the next generation of device today, when none existed just 18 yeah. months ago. Yeah. I see the same thing happening in AI. So we will play the role of cheerleader, albeit with dhoti and kurta and no skirts. Uh, and we will play the role of an enabler um, uh, to the best of our ability. And I'm absolutely convinced that uh, this partnership of the government and young Indians uh, all around the country is... Uh, is going to take us over the top and make us the third largest economy. So we, we look forward to much more of that cheerleading. But let me end by asking you, you gave us examples of what the government has been able to do uh, in being able to leverage the digital public infrastructure and what we've seen now as far as UPI is concerned, what we're likely to see with ONDC. What's the next big moment uh, you know, that, that you envisage at this point in time, given the pipes that have already been uh, laid, as well as the priorities that the government has? What's going to be the next big thing? I think you will see a, a, a significant acceleration of the digitalization of our economy. MSMEs today that have had a patchy record of digitalization are going to now digitalize very rapidly, uh, accelerate. The government has had digitalization in, in many silos. You will see a very accelerated all of government uh, type of digitalization. And I, and I think the India DPI story is just going to get better, bigger, with more and more opportunities for startups to innovate around that India DPI. It's not a static situation. There's going to be AI in that. There's going to be a lot of intelligence and smarts built into what we're doing uh, digitally. So I think, look, I say this when I go to any college, this is certainly, if you're a young techie starting out, this is certainly the most exciting time in the history of India. And I must say one thing, that you're the luckiest generation ever in, the Indi in independent India's history. So you guys are lucky. I hope you just take care of, uh, use the opportunity and do good. Uh, well, the luckiest generation in the words of Rajiv Chandrasekhar. So make, make good use of that opportunity. I'll end by asking you, uh, do you chat GPT or BARD? Or, I mean, are you, are you using artificial intelligence yourself? I, I, I'm all over the place. I'm, You're I'm, all over I'm, the place. I'm, I'm That's that. not a very nice thing to say. No, no, no I'm, <laughs> I, I'm all over the place as in I'm on all of them. I'm a platform agnostic, as I should be. I'm also on the dark internet, so I, I, if, you, if you see me in a chat room there, and you see uh, somebody who's uh, got a moniker of a minister, that's me, uh, trying to eavesdrop and see what you guys are talking about. So. Omnipresent Rajiv Chandrasekhar, many, Thank many you. thanks for joining us. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, you. a big round of applause for the minister for joining us here this afternoon. I'm going to request you to just stay on for, for a couple of minutes more. We have a big reveal coming up. Chandra, over to you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful session, Shireen and sir. Bigger round of applause, Bangalore. Um, so, you know, Shireen asked about your quirk with pencil and pens. I believe there's a unique clock in your office that runs in reverse. Can you tell us a little about that? When I got this job, it was about uh, 1,100 days to elections. And I would uh, have these meetings with my officers and they would keep telling me, what is your hurry? I mean, there's uh, many days left. So I then installed this little countdown reverse clock. And I would tell them, look, I have only 1,000 days left, and now it's about 49 days left. <laughs> but then, look, I'm in a hurry because I have to finish this work uh, as a, before the time runs out. And you guys obviously can stay on and for uh, ever and ever. I can't. I don't even know if I like, have a job. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to reset the clock for five more years. Uh, That's our hope. <laughs> But, sir, please stay on. I'd like to invite Josefa Motiwala, Director, Systems Engineering, India and SAC, Polo Alto Networks, to join us on stage to felicitate the Minister.
Thank you, Josefa Motiala. I'd now like to invite Mahesh Makija, technology consulting leader, EY, to join us on stage to present the idea of India generative AI's potential to catalyze change. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure we have copies of the report that you can go over, take back home with you, uh, read the fine print. But for those of you who haven't had a sneak peek at it, I'm going to get very quickly the big reveal, the big numbers. Thanks. Thanks, Shireen. So, so the report will be with you soon. Um, just three things I want to say about the report. One is it gives you a state of the union of India. We polled around 250 execs across different industries and just got a sense check of where they are on AI and generative AI. And you know the findings, spoiler alert, no big surprises. We found that almost three in four of them not prepared, not clear on where the value is going to come from, how the technology will evolve, what are the use cases. But the flip side, huge amount of optimism. Right. Optimism on how to use this technology. Right. right? Thank so that's you. Sorry. Continue. Just one more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, like Shirin said, the big reveal really is we did a, I think what the first deep dive in terms of what will be the GDP impact of this technology of India. Our findings uh, are that by 2030, it will add almost $1.5 trillion to the Indian economy cumulatively. <laughs> so really, really optimistic and uh, do give us feedback after you read it. Wow. That's the big number. Thank you for that, sir. One final thing. We have Chris Miller all the way from the US, the author of Chip War, and he would like to present an autographed copy of his book. I know you've read his book, but this is one that one for keeps at your office, along with the digital clock. Thank you so much for that, Shireen. And thank you so much, Minister Chandrasekhar. Huge round of applause.